Thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon on Windrush Day for the panel, Daughters and Sons of the Post-Windrush Generation, Reflections and New Directions. Firstly, thank you to Wolfson President Jane Clark for hosting us. Thank you also to the Centre for the Study of Global Human Movement, to Babasaran, Jenny Manda and Jack Webb. And of course, thank you to the conveners of the event, Wolfson Fellow Dr. Kenny Monroe's, PhD student Isabel Higgins and Joe Cotton from Cambridge Sociology. Windrush Day was instituted in 2018 following a campaign led by Patrick Vernon. And we hope that today's panel will be a chance to consider how the work of British scholars such as Nicola Rollock, Rennie Edo Lodge, Kenny Monroe, Athel Hirsch and Ali Meji have informed a new generation of contemporary scholarship. We will hear from those whose parents and or grandparents are members of the Windrush generation and learn how they've been inspired by the academic work of the post-Windrush generation, as well as the lived experiences of their families and communities and how this has informed their commitment to academic scholarship. We also hope that this event will allow Cambridge students at different levels and across different disciplines to come together and connect on a number of different topics on the legacies of Windrush, whilst also leaving space for each speaker to focus on what they're most interested in and inspired by. I will now be handing over to Anoa, who is Wolfson College BME officer and will be chairing today's event to introduce our panelists, Sharon, Mayer, Malik and Wayne. Thanks so much, Aisling. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Anwar Avikomensa. Like Aisling said, I'm the Wolfson BAME representative and I'm a first year HSPS student at Wolfson. Um, I'm really excited for today. We have four amazing panelists who are going to talk about their experiences, what Windrush means to them um, and how their research and academic work has been influenced by their identity as members of the post Windrush generation. Um, I'm just going to summarize really quickly who we've got speaking today and then I will hand over to our first speaker, Malik. Um, so Malik is a livable, a livable born performance poet. He's a filmmaker and a social researcher and activist of Guyanese heritage. Um, he's written articles and conducted social research projects for the Guardian newspaper and for the London School of Economics. Um, he matriculated in 2020 at St. Catherine's College, Cambridge, um, where he's reading a PhD in history and he's been granted a fellowship at Tufts University in Boston. Um, our second speaker will be Dr. Sharon Walker. Um, she is a sociologist of education with a particular interest in how education systems are shaped by racial thinking. Um, she's published in the field of comparative and international education and the erasure of racism within this field. And she's also a former primary school teacher. Um, our third speaker will be Maya McFarlane. She is a second year student at Pembroke College um, and she's studying human, social and political sciences like me. Um, she specializes in sociology and she's the former women's and non-binary officer for the student, uni student union BME campaign. Um, and she's the outgoing undergraduate ethnic minorities officer for Pembroke. Um, and then our last speaker will be Wayne Weaver, who is currently reading for a PhD in music at the University of Cambridge. And his thesis is loose Loosely entitled Space, Race and the Music in Late 18th Century Kingston. Um, Wayne's research not only looks into this area but also investigates how Jamaica's residents use the island's musical activity as a vehicle for expressions of racial ideologies. Um, so without any further ado, I want to introduce Malik. Um, would you just like to introduce yourself and we'll get started. Hi, thank you so much uh, for having me here today and thanks to um, Kenny for, um, for inviting me to speak here today. I'm probably the anomaly here um, because um, the majority of the panelists I understand are from the Windrush um, generation, um, but there was another generation prior to the Windrush um, that is not often alluded to, and that was my father's generation. So my father had us late in life. Um, he was born in 1918 and he settled in England in the 1930s. So by the time the Empire Windrush uh, first docked um, here in England, uh, my father, along with many other Guyanese and West Indian seamen, were already well established in Cardiff and Tiger Bay, uh, also in London and also in Liverpool. So there's a pre-Windrush history, which um, is, is also something which is, you know, which we should acknowledge. Um, so what the Windrush generation meant to me was lodges, because we had a big house. <laughs> so when the Windrush came in, all the Guyanese who came in on it came to lodge with, you know, with, with, with us. Um, so we were, um, you know, brought up in 
1960s in Toxteth in Liverpool, which is an incredibly cosmopolitan area. And um, it's reputedly the oldest black community in Europe. Um, there have been accounts of black people um, in Toxteth uh, dating back to the 17th century. Um, there may even be um, historic records um, that we haven't yet uncovered of earlier arrivals. You know, the charter for the Royal Africa Company was given by Queen Elizabeth. So we're talking, um, you know, mid 16th century when the first sort of expedition started to go out to West Africa. And of course, even prior to that, there was, you know, the Moors in, in Spain and after the Reconquista, many of them were driven out. And there's talk that some of them came to England and various different places. And you see, you know, Blackmoor Street and things like that. So, you know, the history of black people in this country dates back far beyond the Windrush, but people allude to the Windrush generation as the time of mass migration and assuming, obviously, that that was the time when most black people that are here uh, arrived. And, and to some extent, that's, that's true, um, but it wasn't the whole story. So from my point of view, um, I was more interested, you know, in regard to the, uh, the Windrush generation in the erasure of um, or the attempted erasure of our cultural identity through the process of assimilation because what was required um, when the Windrush generation and those that preceded them came here was that they should adjust to British society and assimilate and that was the idea. So when I was doing my undergraduate research, I looked at the assimilation models that were out there, and there was a famous one by a guy called Milk Gordon, who um, his model was established in the, uh, I think in the 1950s, and, and to some extent, and to a great extent, it's probably still effective today. So he identified various forms of assimilation, uh, one of which was behavioral receptional assimilation, which is... Um, to teach people when they come to the host society how to behave like the people within the host society. And what he said was a prerequisite of doing that was to actually concentrate them in ghettos. So the idea was that they would concentrate together in a place where they could be contained and where they could be trained to behave like the British. So if they'd come from Africa and they were used to building a fire in the street and bending over to cook, now we had to teach them to go in the house and stand up laterally you know in front of a cooker and and don't start a fire in the sleep don't slaughter a sheep in your back garden and so on so this behavioral reception assimilation was done to induct them if you like into the british way but what comes as a natural consequence of that is a group cohesiveness and milk gordon recommended that to fully assimilate them they had to destroy or break up that internal group cohesiveness through a policy of dilute and disperse and that policy of dilute and disperse is the same that you would use with pollution. You know, one part pollution to 10 parts water. You can't see the pollution, you can still drink the water. Um, so that was the idea. And then they used marital assimilation um, and, and a range of other uh, forms of structural assimilation through social policy to, um, to make the people who had arrived indistinguishable from the host society. And, and the mechanism of, of social policy that they used was housing policy. So having concentrated them in ghettos for years, the idea was then to break them up and spread them out. And then through marital assimilation, you would breed the black out of them. So at the end of it, they would become culturally and visually um, indistinguishable from the host population. And that process is the most extreme form of assimilation, which is effectively acculturation. And I'm just gonna finish on this point. What was most um, interesting to me when I looked at this model was two things. One, that it didn't appear to have been challenged uh, as late as the 90s when I was doing this as an undergrad. Um, and, and two, that there was so much social policy that had been developed uh, upon it um, that it permeated throughout every aspect of our lives, including my own, because they would use housing policy to compulsory purchase all the black seamen who bought their houses, who were receiving the Windrush generation. And, you know, they dispersed us to white areas. Um, I went to an area with four black families and 100,000 white families. Uh, prior to that, we were hosting the people who'd come over from the Windrush generation because we had an established 
um, community, which they came into, and we then facilitated them when they arrived. Um, and it was unfortunate that we were unable to do that. And the second point was that when the British went out to do their empire, I didn't see any British people becoming Zulus, Native Americans, Burmese, you know, indigenous Amerindians, you know, um, Arabs. They went out everywhere and they forced people to assimilate into their way, even when they were the minority in the whole society. Um, so the precept, that, you know, the, the concept there was one of white supremacy. Um, and so the, the idea of integration and assimilation as being the, you know, a prerequisite of, um, you know, arriving in a, in a, in a host country, uh, I think is, is, is a nonsense. And the, uh, the Windrush scandal um, lately sort of um, demonstrated that. So, um, so that's me, pre-Windrush. Wow, that is so interesting. Um, and speaking of that, actually, um, thinking about histories before Windrush, but that are linked to Windrush, um, I think, is there any way you could maybe tell us a bit more about the empire and slavery and the historical backdrop for the migration from Commonwealth from the Commonwealth into Britain? Because um, obviously it didn't start um, with Windrush or with your generation, it started with what you were talking about, that empire. So can you develop on that? Um, and yeah, just tell us a bit more about that. So my current research is on the impact of the Guyana um, sugar and slave trade on the wider slave economy between 1719 and 1840. Uh, sugar at the time was called white gold and slaves um, being um, you know, enslaved in Africa and taken to the, um, the Americas, particularly South America, uh, when they would arrive in, in, in Demerara, um, they were called uh, black ivory because they were so valuable despite the decimated state that they would arrive in having spent three months at sea in the most appalling of, of, of inhuman uh, conditions. Um, but the commodification of, um, of black people, of, of African bodies, of human souls, um, through the legal mechanism of, of the principle of, of basically the supremacy of parliament, you know, they, they have this idea um, that they have the right to make any law, regardless of how abhorrent it is. And, um, and they can provide a, a framework for, um, for any crime and legitimize it. And what I found when I was doing my research uh, was not only that black people had obviously been here for a, you know, a very long time, but whilst they were here, there was a very nuanced uh, set of arrangements that had been made for them. Um, when we looked at, for instance, the Somerset case that was um, with Lord Mansfield in the 1760s, it held that um, no, uh, you know, there was no principle in English law to enslave someone in England. Um, and Somerset had come over as a slave and um, he worked with some abolitionists and they baptized him. And he said, well, he's baptized now. How can he be a piece of property if he's been baptized? He's a man. Um, and that case had major ramifications, particularly for America because when Benjamin Franklin heard about the Somerset case, um, they thought that England's freed all the slaves and they were an English colony at the time. And that was one of the things which, you know, perpetuated them to start raising the militias to initiate the, um, the war of independence from Britain because they thought that their economy would collapse because of the Mansfield case and, and, and Britain fleeing the slaves. But the point is there's a legal framework which is established to legitimize the dehumanization of one group by another. And then there is a moral argument which is construed in order to be able to provide the justification for that. And that moral argument in, in this case was provided by the church. And what I found so um, uh, disturbing in my research is that all of the slave traders, when I traced my ancestry back through Demerara slavery, who were sugar merchants, some of the most prolific sugar merchants, some of the richest people in Britain at the time, um, every single branch of their family, when I looked at them genealogically, ha had a reverend in it. Um, some of them were actually um, responsible for establishing, um, you know, whole systems of, uh, uh, of, of, you know, branches of religious doctrine um, and writing books on it and providing all sorts of, you know, religious returns and so on. So they were not low level clergy, they were high level clergy but their brothers, their parents, their children were all engaged in the slave trade and they were providing the moral justification for it. And the quid pro quo was that um, they were using the proceeds to, 
to build churches. And Liverpool, if anyone's been here, will know that we have some of the most ornate churches. And one street with merchant houses, you can have six, seven different churches on the same street, each one uh, outdoing the other in terms of its opulence. Um, and most of that was funded through through enslavement. So that's, you know, uh, uh, you know, there's a big history, obviously, you can't encapsulate it in a few minutes, and I don't want to take up too much time. But that is the sort of nexus, if you like, upon which my um, research for my PhD sort of gyrates at the moment. Wow, that's amazing. Um, and my very last question before we move on. Um, how has your identity as um, being from Guyana and, and that of your parents, how has that influenced your research at the moment and your future aspirations? Well, I never had a Guyanese identity other than my father was from Guyana and he used to speak with the Patois and he used to play, you know, Calypso reggae and the likes of Lord Kitchener that you just heard and so on um, in the house. Um, other than that, we had no Guyanese identity. And once we were moved away to the white area, I mean, it was erased. And my father died. He was quite old when he had us. He was born in 1918, had us in the 60s. So he was, you know, I was a teen. He was, he passed away. Um, so, you know, my mother's white. So we didn't, we didn't have any Guyanese identity. So this is the whole idea of your cultural identity being eradicated by slavery and colonialism um, and then assimilation. Um, so from, I, mean, I think the first time I came to Cambridge University, um, not, not the first time, first time I came in 2011, I did a performance, but in 2017, I did a, a program I called Artists as Activists for the Faculty of uh, Latin American Studies. And it was about how we use our art, um, in my case, spoken word, as a means of activism to, um, to articulate and reassert our cultural identity um, so that we can take back, if you like, that which belongs to us, because if you look at the um, historical records for, for, the, for the white people during the same period, they were meticulously documented, you know, born, died, parents, occupations, um, you know, baptism records and everything. And then you looked at the enslaved populations, they had a first name, often no surname, and then they would be, you know, born about so and so, you know, they didn't really take, you know, it's like a horse, oh yeah, I was born a couple of years ago, they wouldn't think of like, recording and documenting that and then the families were always being split up and sold off and so on so there was no way to really maintain that level of um of hereditary identity whether it was through the transition of property through the transition of land or through the transition of names or cultural uh, nuances religions and so on all of that was wiped away deliberately and eradicated and done in such a way as to make it almost impossible for you to unpick it so that you would be forever like a tree with no roots you could never put yourself down anywhere firmly and establish yourself so whilst you're constantly in this state of flux you're vulnerable to being continually exploited downtrodden and if you don't have that internal group cohesiveness you don't have the collective you know, power to be able to do anything about it. Um, and I think that was a very deliberate thing, um, purely because it was done meticulously for the white population during the same period. It wasn't like they didn't have the knowledge or the understanding of how to do it or why to do it. You know, just look at Burke's peerages, you know, they know how to maintain history, um, but they deliberately did not in our case. And it's a question of us now using all those um, skills and uh, research techniques and methodologies that are available to us in these times and entering the academy and, and you know, having a voice and a presence and being at the table um, to sort of direct these kind of endeavors where we can start to take back that cultural identity and reassert it, whether that's through art, culture, religion, faith, names, uh, historical accounts or, or, or whatever that is. But I think it's important to have that identity. If you know where you come from, you know who you are and where you're going. That is amazing. Thank you so, so much for speaking to us, Malik. And um, we'll be speaking to Malik again at the end in the Q&A. Um, so I will now pass on to Dr. Sharon Walker, who I said before is a sociologist of education. Hi, Sharon. Hi, hello. I'm just going to share a screen. Um, I just put some slides together just to stop me from yakking incessantly. It just controls me a little bit. So I'll just, um, I'll just put that up. All right. So... Um, I, in thinking about, when I was thinking about um, the questions and the focus of this session, and it's really strange because when I say strange, when I think about myself in terms, um, in relation to the Windrush, 
I think that often I think about it in a much more personal way um, rather than, oh, maybe I, I say that, but maybe when you come to my slides later, I probably do think about it more politically than I realize I do. But um, my, my family, my parents came to Britain. They didn't know each other at the time they met in Britain. They came um, in about 1965 and my gran, I think she came in the late 1950s, originally in Manchester and then came down to London. And my dad, when he came to Britain, he came with the, they came from Barbados, my family. Um, they came, um, rather he came with the kind of call that went out after the war, um, the need for workers. So when he came, he originally worked on London transport and then eventually he um, worked in the post office because there wasn't much work in Barbados. He had tried very hard to find employment, but at that particular time, um, the job market was quite depressed in the Caribbean. And so, um, and so many um, young black men and women um, like him, my um, godparents, um, my aunts, uncles came um, to Britain because they had been asked to come to Britain. And it's quite funny when my dad, um, they, but all my parents, when they speak about coming to Britain, they honestly believe the streets are paved with gold because they had a colonial education and they were taught that Britain was a place where the streets were made of gold. And when they came, they remember that kind of shock and they remember it being gray. I mean, if you've ever been to the Caribbean, the Caribbean is very bright and it's very colorful and you can imagine the contrast. Fortunately, my dad, he arrived in August fortunately, whereas my mum arrived a little bit later in the year, never a good plan if you're not used to being from the Caribbean and coming somewhere where it's not so bright. And so I think many of them, my dad said he had really bad nightmares at the beginning, um, not just from being homesick, but because of the the, the greyness, the, the darkness and, and, you know, simple things like not having the sea nearby. And also I can remember my dad saying that the first time that he saw a white man sweep in the street that he stood and stared and watched him for a long time because in Barbados, you would never have seen that because there was the idea that that was just not the work of white men. Black people did that, particularly dark skinned black people. And so he said that for him, that was a moment whereby, if you like his internal cosmos flipped upside down, he kind of realized that something had been told to him that wasn't true about the world because here he was watching somebody who otherwise he believed shouldn't be doing that job who was doing that job. And so for my parents, coming to, Bar coming to England was a, uh, a journey which challenged many of the ways that they thought. And um, I've put some like points up on the, the screen here. You know, when I think about my family and I think about them coming to Britain and I think about myself um, uh, as a youngster growing up in Britain. Um, and I think, you know, for us, we were just living at the time, I'm not sure if at the time, I mean, obviously people knew that they had arrived from um, different islands and they had known that at one point that there had been um, people who'd come like in 1948 on a, on a boat. But I don't know if at the time that they would have described themselves as the Windrush generation. They were just living. They were just trying to find work, trying to um, you know, um, uh, pay rent. They were often cheated of money. They were not given mortgages if they could afford it by banks. Um, they were not allowed to worship in the same churches as white people or use the same work gym. So all these kind of things that they were just trying to be and to just live. And um, as Malik was saying, they grouped. So my gran, when she came down from Manchester, she lived, went to um, northeast London, the kind of Hornsey, Frinsby Park area. And as many of you know, you still have a lot of um, large groups of West Indians living in that part of um, London. So they grouped. And they grouped because, I mean, the islands are small. You always know someone who knows somebody. And my parents still to this day, they, they can almost track the people from where they grew up in Barbados and tell me exactly where they are in London, where their children are. They can track them because everybody knows everybody. And so they grouped together and they supported each other and they protected each other. And also, even though my, um, when I think about the kind of neighborhood that we grew up in, my my mum in particular, because my mum is a very social person, she had, she made connections with all kinds of people in our street, including um, she had white friends in our street as well. But even though that there were those connections, for example, we used to go visit the lady a few doors down who was very, very ill at the time. We used to go and see her and sit with her and have a cup of tea and a chat and a dog used to lick my face, which I didn't like very much. But, um, but then, and the lady, if you doors down on the other side, she only had one son and we might, we have a, I have a brother. And so she used to come pick up my brother 
they were quite a middle class white family actually, which was quite strange because at the time Walthamstow um, was very, very working class, mm-hmm. um, not its kind of gentrified um, way that it is. Um, I say Walthamstow because my immediate family, mum, dad and my siblings moved out of the Hornsey area and moved to Walthamstow because they were able to um, afford a house there, but not because they got a loan from a bank, they had to borrow money among the Caribbean community and then pay back members of the Caribbean community. So even though we had friends in the Walthamstow area who crossed um, um, ethnic groups, if you like, there was still a sense of um, fight. There was still a sense whereby you had to stand up for and protect yourself, protect your own. I remember one day having um, Top of the Pops interrupted because we heard a, a crash in the street and we ran to look out the window and over the road there was a, um, a white guy who was um, fighting in the street with my brother's um, uh, godfather Um, and and the white guy, his family were were quite known for being a bit racist. And so those kind of things were a part of my um, childhood, knowing that although we were, you know, in the playground, we we were making friends with children from all kinds of groups, because at the time, Walthamstow, it had a predominantly white working class population, but there was um, children from um, uh, migrant families. So there were uh, Caribbean, African Caribbean, there were African, Bangladeshi, Pakistani, um, Turkish, you name it. And so we were making friends in the playground. But this was a time of skinheads. And this was a time we used to have lots of fights in the streets between um, black boys and skinheads. You had fights in the playground. We had a kind of um, like a protection network. So if any of the children in the lower school picked on me and called me names as black, the black children from the upper school, it was like a, you sent the word they'd come and get them. So you kind of knew there was a protection network. So children knew not to bother you because they, we looked after each other, we protected each other. And and I've got there, I, you know, I've got, you know, under me, my siblings and I, when I talk to my siblings about our, about being young, you know, there's a whole idea of, um, I always knew as a child that I was never the pretty white child. I was never the child who um, got chosen to play, I don't know, to be a ballerina or my sister once actually got chosen to play Mary in the nativity play. That was big news. I was like, oh my God, the black girl is playing Mary. My sister was fair skinned though. Whether I would have been chosen to play Mary would be another issue. But then we never got chosen for things like this. When we did, um, we used to belong to a dance troupe. We were always put in the back of the dance troupe. And once we were even dressed in bear costumes and put in the back of the dance troupe, so you couldn't actually see our faces, which is awful when I think about it. Probably explains why my mum had an incredibly huge row with the people who ran the group. And as children, we just watched on because we were petrified. But um, but yeah, so it was really, we lived a really complex, uh, when I think back on my childhood, we, although I never understood myself as the Windrush generation, I did understand that I was in a, in a social climate that was um, that was racialized, that had problems of race, and that had conflicts across racial lines, um, even at our very little level in terms of the little arguments and fights and etc. That we had, and um, and I was thinking because what I really wanted to do was to get some pictures together of um, from back in the day from my gran and etc. Um, etc. And there is one picture that shows my sister and I sitting on a, um, a sofa having our picture taken, it's in black and white. And I remember the guy who came to do that, he set up all of his camera stuff and like, you know, the, the lots of equipment. But the reason why I remember it is that as a child, um, we had very few white people who came into our house and he was one of them. And I was only been about four at the time, but that was quite a, a memory that stuck in my mind. I remember that man, not because he took a photo of us, because he was a white man in our house. And so therefore it really imprinted on my mind that he wasn't outside in my school or in the shops, he was in my house. And that really shows you that, you know, that there was a difference, there was a divide in how we lived, even though we were kind of living together on the same street or in the same um, in the same neighborhood. And so when I think about um, what's inspired me, um, I think I'm very much inspired. I mean, I'm always inspired by the stories of my, um, 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 like my older relatives and the stories that they tell of when they first came to England. And as I said, I, you know, when I look back on it, it really was a story of survival really. And, and I'm aware that As I said, I'm not sure that at the time we would have described ourselves as a Windrush generation in any kind of collective whole sense in the way that we use that term now. And that really makes me think, and I think to myself, you know, that term has arisen in the present 
because of the absence or erasure of people. And so the fact that um, black um, people coming into Britain and particularly black Caribbean um, at that time is because we have had histories of um, absence, i.e. not being seen um, and erasure that you, we can have the concept of the Windrush generation because that rather than that idea making us look at the Caribbean populations or the British Caribbean populations that it designates, that it actually should make us look at the host country because it said something about the host country that they've come to. Because if the host country was different or if their kind of arrival and reception in Britain had been different, we may not be talking about the Windrush generation in the same way. They would have just been people who arrived on a boat at a particular time in history and just got on with it. But then that couldn't have happened because when you think about Britain, sometimes when I was very young, when I used to walk home from school, in my mind, I used to imagine the world differently. And I used to pretend that I had wiped it all clean and that I used to place all the, I used to put all the grass and all the trees back in. And then I'd put all the buildings back in and then I'd start populating it with people. But at the point I started populating it with people, I would rub it out and start again. And then the next day on the way home from school, I would do the same thing again, as if somehow I would be able to figure out how to make the world different or better. But then the honest truth is, once you start to populate it with people, you realise that those relationships, um, people haven't, yeah, I don't know, people haven't, anyway, yeah. So, um, and when I think about the kind of, I sometimes think about how would the world, how would Britain today be different if, when my parents and my gran had arrived, they would have been able to get loans for houses. They would have been able to get jobs that match the skills and the education that they had in the Caribbean. So for example, the guy over the road, he was a teacher, came from Montserrat, but he couldn't get work as a teacher here. And so he had to get work in much in, in low level skills jobs. What would the world have been like if people had been allowed to worship in the same churches? Or if, um, as often happened to my mum, people didn't get passed over when they were standing in queues as if they weren't there. But it's hard to imagine that world because the bottom line is Windrush generation tells us something about Britain, that Britain is a xenophobic country historically um, with a very ethno-nationalist identity, which is attached to white identities. I say historically because obviously that continues. And hence we have this kind of idea of a Windrush generation because it represents something um, something that's gone wrong, not with that generation, but with the country that hosted them, so to speak, or apparently um, hosted them. And also when you think about things, when I think about things like Windrush Day, and um, you know, and you know, and I think it's fantastic that we have Windrush Day, but sometimes it doesn't sit well with me that we have words when you see write-ups about Windrush Day, that we have expressions like we need to play, uh, pay tribute um, to the Windrush generation, or that we have to um, mark the contribution of Black Britons. Sometimes I'm of the opinion that if I came to Britain and I just sat and scratched all day and didn't contribute as a Black person, I'm still a British citizen. Do I have to prove my contribution for somebody to give me tribute and make that worth celebrating? If I sat and scratched all day and did nothing, does that make me less worthy of claiming my British citizenship? I'm a British citizen. End of story. Why do we still have to have this sense whereby I have to keep proving my contribution? On the one side of the coin, I recognize the importance of that because it has been erased, because people do not know the history of this country in relation to the people who came from the Caribbean. So it's important that we pay tribute and that we understand that contribution. But on the flip side, we have to ask, why have we got to a place where we have to constantly acknowledge that contribution? Why do I have to acknowledge that I contribute? I purposely don't, to be quite honest. I think to myself, you know, does X or Y down the road have to acknowledge their contribution? No, they don't. They just breathe in and out and get on with it. And nobody ever questions their, their belonging to Britain or their right to be in Britain, not having to justify why they're in Britain. And I think that many of the thoughts that I've just mentioned there, that they kind of inspire my research because I've always been fascinated by it as a, since I was a young child in, in, in the whole concept of race, how we do this thing called race and the kind of how we're invested um, in this idea of um, and race and also how that therefore impacts on um, different people's lives, experiences and outcomes. And the idea that you could have a group of people who could just think that they are better simply because they're born a particular color. That's always um, 
uh, gripped off, uh, when I say fascinated, not in the same way that, you know, a shooting star would fascinate you, because that's a thing of beauty, but this fascinates me in the sense of, um, I, 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 I find it quite a shocking thing. And so therefore my mind is captivated by it, I think. And so therefore um, it's probably no accident that I find myself um, doing research that is very much focused on understanding um, race and processes of um, racialization and, and racism. And so uh, just to uh, finish off, in terms of thinking about my future aspirations, I used to be a teacher, a primary school teacher. And, um, and in terms of an aspiration of mine, I, I think it's absolutely necessary um, you know, there's so many arguments at the moment around and decolonizing and the teaching of empire. I don't understand why the need for these arguments, because to me, I think it's necessary to educate our children and the nation more broadly about the Windrush generation and, and more specifically, not just about that generation and their contribution, etc., but specifically about the British Empire. So we understand or, or we can contextualize the relationship between the Caribbean. Um, the continent of Africa and Britain, and also why people from the Caribbean, people of African heritage, are here in or have are here in such large numbers, particularly since the um, uh, since the um, 1950s. And so I think it's you know there's an imperative for me to make sure that children um, learn about these things and are made aware of these things and um, are able to engage with them and critically. And the other thing that I think about is I sometimes wonder. Um, whether we have a limited narrative of what it means to be Black British, that there's only one way to be Black British. So, for example, people might say to me, I mean, I like reggae. OK, yeah, fine. But then I like other types of music far better than reggae. But if I say I don't like reggae so much, oh, my God, the questions I get, almost as if I'm not really Black if I don't like reggae. People always assume I can rap. Why is that? Why do people assume I cannot rap? It's too complicated. I wouldn't know how to start or to begin. But already it's a very, you can see that people have a very limited idea of what it means to be black and to be British. And I think that we need to have far more narratives and expectations around what it means to be black and British. Why aren't there more black people who are top mathematicians? Or why aren't there more black people who are astronomers? Why is this not something that we just envision, uh, envision as something that just is? Rather, we accept if we see a black boys who are grime artists, yeah, cool, or a footballer, we have no problem with that. And yet we don't ask ourselves questions. When I say we, I mean us as a nation, we don't ask ourselves questions as to why we don't see people in roles where we, don't, we currently don't expect to see people, which I think represents the fact that we have a very narrow understanding of what it means to be black and British. And I think that we should have a wider expectations of, um, because you know, my life and expectations are so different to my great grands, even though obviously I have a cultural link to um, Barbados, I cannot pretend for a moment that the way I see the world or experience the world is the same as my great grand. It is not. My life is almost unrecognizable to my great grand. The, the things that I do, the opportunities that I have, the way that I speak, the way that I move, everything about me is completely different because I'm living in a different world context at a different time. And I think that it's important that we broaden um, the narrative of what it means to be black British so that we don't, um, I mean, uh, Malik talked earlier about assimilation and in that way you get a sense of uh, black identity being rubbed out. But I think on the other end of the scale that because we give limited narratives of black identity that's another way of rubbing out black possibilities I think so but anyway so that's that's all I wanted to say thank you thank you so much for that Sharon there was just so much packed in there like that was amazing um and also if anyone has any questions we will be having a Q&A towards the end so drop any questions that you have in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen and we will get to them soon thank you so much Sharon for that Okay. Um, so the next person we're going to be speaking to is Maya. Um, so Maya, if you'd like to introduce yourself and um, get started. Sure, thank you so much. Hello everyone, I'm really excited to be here today and have these conversations with you all. Um, and thank you to the speakers who have already gone, like it's so interesting to hear everyone's different perspectives and stories. Um, so for me, the Windrush arrival was something I remember learning about in primary school for the first time. And I remember feeling 
seen and visible in a way that I hadn't ever before in school. Um, the stories that we heard were more than just abstract tales. I knew that I could connect those to the personal realities of my grandparents um, on both sides of my family. Um, so for context, both of my dad's parents came over from Jamaica in the 50s and settled in Sheffield uh, before moving to London when my dad was about eight. So he kind of went from a little white village to something that's a bit less white. Um, so he had like kind of a weird dual experience. Um, and my mum has mixed race heritage um, and was born to my white English grandmother. He fell in love with my granddad when he came over here from Jamaica when he was just 19, which is actually my age now. Um, so now that I'm the same age that he was when he came over here, it's really started to hit me recently how big a journey that must have been for him. It makes me wonder, you know, what sort of glimmering future and gold paved streets, as you know, has been said, was he hoping to gain by giving up everything he'd already known? Um, and so I think for me, bravery is definitely the first word that comes to mind when I think of my granddad and his generation. Um, and I think the biggest thing that they've instilled in me is the power of generosity and collectivism. My grandparents didn't have much. My mum has five siblings and my dad has eight. Uh, so you can only imagine what that must have been like, trying to get food on the table and making sure everyone had enough to eat. Um, but I'm told that despite all of that, their house was always open to anyone who needed it, um, particularly other Jamaican people who had just come over and needed a place to start and a place to stay. And I think in a time of rampant neoliberal individualism, those lessons of collectivism and coming together and helping out your neighbours is perhaps more important than ever. If we think about, for example, the free school meals atrocity that happens throughout lockdown, um, the overriding sentiment was one of greed and meritocracy. This idea that, oh, you can't feed your kids, that's not my problem. Um, and it was so harmful and incredibly disappointing to see, but unfortunately not surprising given the recent social climate, right? And I think looking back, it upset me so much because it went so against the lessons that we've learned from the Rindrash generation as you could call it, um, and proved once again that their wisdom is perhaps more urgent than ever. And I think these lessons of generosity and collectivism have obviously informed my personal life, but they've also impacted my academic pathway in many ways. In a place like Cambridge, it can feel very tempting to fall into the selfish trap of just looking out for yourself. You know, this idea that you've made it here, so just keep your head down and just get your degree and move on. Don't worry about everyone else, just do what you need to do for you and you'll be fine. Um, and I think luckily the lessons from my grandparent generation has taught me that, you know, you have the power that you need inside of you to resist that temptation. It reminds me that I didn't get here on my own. Um, you know, I got here from the sacrifices that my grandparents made and the hard labor they endured to get here. And it serves no one to forget that. My blackness is also something that I don't feel I have to hide or tone down in order to be here. We've heard about, you know, the pressure to assimilate. And I know for generations of students at Cambridge, at least, that has been a really big pressure. Um, but I think, again, the Windrush generation teach us that you don't have to do that in order to feel empowered and to find your place in the society. You can redefine what Britishness means to you, and that's completely OK. Um, and I think also keeping with the spirit of collectivism and community that my grandparents taught me, it's super important to me that no matter where my research goes, it's in its very early stages, um, I really want it to be focused on uplifting our communities and giving us sociological language to really articulate those experiences. Um, so for instance, I've recently started planning my third year dissertation, uh, which is very scary, but also really exciting. Um, and I've decided to focus on the role of black hair in constructions of black womanhood. Um, so looking at the black salon as a backstage space away from the white gaze, but also looking at how actually the salon isn't completely a backstage and there's still very specific performances going on of how to be a black woman the right way. Um, and I think hair is such a rich symbol for sociological analysis. Um, so many of my core memories are of my mum and her combing my hair on a Sunday after washing it. And although lots of these memories are littered with pain and getting my hair pulled, I think it's also a really beautiful intergenerational experience. And a moment of family that I think is so often overlooked when it comes to scholarship about the Black experience. If we think about the legacies of, for example, the 1965 Moynihan Report, which basically scapegoated Black mothers and blamed them for their own poverty, the positive aspects of the Black maternal experience, you know, the relationships we have with grandparents, they're so easily overlooked to focus on us as problematic. 
black families as chaotic and unstable and careless. And those narratives, I think for most of us are so far from our reality, especially when we think about, you know, the warmth and solidarity that we feel still connected to that generation of people who came over here on the Rindrush. I also think that hair is a really interesting way about thinking about how pain is normalized among black women in particular, leading to stereotypes about our strength, which can be incredibly harmful. So I spoke about my grandfather, but my grandmothers on both sides of my family had far from an easy experience. Um, so for my white nan on my mum's side, raising mixed race children in the social climate of the 50s and 60s was obviously not easy. Um, and I'm grateful to have been able to cultivate a relationship with her where, you know, she speaks to me about those things. But I know that there are certain struggles and traumatic experiences that she'll never talk to anyone about. Um, so I think when we talk about the Rindrash generation, where it's important to remember we're not just talking about the people who came over on these specific boats, on these specific journeys. We're talking about an entire generational shift that occurred across the whole of Britain, including white people, and how that impacted their attitudes and the way they saw the world. Um, it meant that people had to choose a side, essentially. Were you to freely associate with black people or were you to follow the mold and do the done thing and essentially remain complicit in systems of racism? And I think that was a struggle that lots of people encountered. Um, and for my black grandmother on my dad's side, there was an immense amount of pressure to hold the family down, as it were. So when my grandpa first came over to England, he came on his own and worked for a few years until he had enough money to be able to send back for my grandma and I think the four children at the time. But until then, she had to find a way to keep the family together. And, you know, whatever loneliness and stress she was feeling, that wasn't an option. She had to carry on and make it work. And I find that this keep going mentality has provided me with a wealth of strength that I've needed to kind of survive in Cambridge and focus on my aspirations, uh, despite, you know, some of the frankly racist experiences that black students still encounter here. Um, so rather than keeping my head down below the parapet and hoping not to be noticed as some of my family members advised me to do, um, I was elected as the BME officer for my college. And I was also the women's officer for the BME campaign. Uh, and I feel so fortunate to have had those experiences. I definitely have the strength of my grandparents to thank for that um, and not being afraid to just do what you want to do. Um, but of course, I think the strong black women trope is a bit of a curse. I think that mental health is something that black communities struggle to talk about often in a candid way. Um, and so when I look back at my grandparents uh, and the whole Windrush generation, I don't really think they ever had those conversations because there just wasn't space for it. And I really wish there was, you know, I wish they had the opportunity to experience therapy and heal their trauma because as happy as I am that they came here from Jamaica, because um, I wouldn't be here otherwise, it was far from a holiday. I, it was a traumatic experience. Um, and so growing up in Southeast London, surrounded by other grandchildren of that generation, I definitely understood the hardship and the racism that my grandparents endured but I don't think I've ever felt as connected to it, I guess, until I came to Cambridge. I was aware that South East London, Lewisham in particular, was not representative of the entire country in terms of racial demographic, but there was honestly nothing that could prepare me for the ignorance and perpetual othering that I was to experience here. My grandparents were so excited when I got in. I think my nan still can't really tell the difference between Oxford and Cambridge, but she was still over the moon for me, regardless. Um, and so I think for black students here, it makes it so much harder to have those negative experiences with white people who feel that they can just say anything to you and just get away with it. Because they're not just dampening your own personal experience here, they're also dampening the hope that your grandparents had for you when they came over here all those years ago. That hope that myself and my cousins would never have to experience anything remotely similar to what they had to deal with in the 50s. And so in terms of my future, I hope that my dissertation turns out to be the start of an exciting academic trajectory and hopefully career. At this point, it's very early in the game and I am mostly going off my personal experience at this point. But one thing the Windows generation have taught me is that my lived experience is valid and that is enough to start with. Generations of black social theorists and decolonial scholars have made that possible. Uh, and so I'm really thankful to all of those people. Um, and to me, I think at its heart, sociology, at least, is a mode of storytelling. And I truly believe that all of those tales and experiences from our grandparents deserve more than just being on the dusty shelves of history. They're so powerfully relevant to our day to day lives. And history isn't just about the past. It's perpetually in the making. And I think as grandchildren of that generation, 
particularly when we're like talking third generation at this point um, of migration, it can be a bit difficult sometimes to maintain those ties that period and, uh, you know, feel connected to those experiences because I'm living a very different life to what my granddad did at 19. Um, but somehow there are still so many experiences that we share um, and that we can find connection in. And I think that's a really beautiful thing that I hope to continue to explore in my academic journey. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maya. Um, I have one question for you um, before we move on to Wayne. Um, so you were the women's uh, non-binary officer for the BME campaign. And as you were talking just now, you were talking a lot about um, women's experiences. Um, so how important do you think it is to consider the intersections of race and gender? And do you think too little attention has been given to the women of the Windrush generation and their stories in particular? I think absolutely. I mean, I think when I first came across the word intersectionality when I was about 16, it completely changed my life. I think if we even think about how we learn about race in school, you know, the very little room that there is for it, you hear about Nelson Mandela and Martin Luther King. And, you know, not only is that completely like not British centered at all and makes you think that, you know, our time in Britain started with the Rindrush, um, it's also very male dominated. And, you know, while the achievements of those figures cannot be discounted, I think there's such a, you know, strong history of black women who have fought the fight and succeeded and contributed in a plethora of ways. Um, I think if we're talking about the Windrush specifically, you know, we hear about the men who came over and worked, but also there were women on that boat as well. I think people seem to forget and other boats similar. And again, that idea of, you know, okay, so your husband's gone away to England. What do you do now? Because it's sure it's not enough money to like survive on a day-to-day -day basis. They have to find themselves accommodation. So what are you going to do? Um, and so it's be, at least speaking to some of my, the older women in my family, it seems like it really was a collective effort. Um, the idea that, you know, I, I mentioned the Moynihan report, which was basically saying that you need, black families, you need to be nuclear and everything will be fine. Mom, dad, two kids, and then you won't be poor. That, well, that didn't work back then. You needed that extended family. You needed the grandmother. You needed all the cousins to come together because there was no other way to survive. And I think at its core, we have black women to thank for that, for holding that family together in the way that they have. Um, I think, you know, obviously the gender binary has its own nuances. Um, but if you talk about black women as like a, a broad group in history, I think there's definitely very particular experiences that are often overlooked. Um, and I think that's wrong and I think it should change. I think it is changing. Um, I think, you know, the fact that there, there was a role for me to uplift those voices is testament to that change. Um, and I'm really grateful to have experienced that. Um, but yeah, I think it's super important to keep recognizing those intersections and also going deeper. You know, black women is not, you know, a homogenous group. There's so many different shapes and sizes and experiences and pathways that operate within that. Um, if you think about class, how that intersects as well, particularly in Cambridge, you come here and you think you'll connect with every black person just because you're black, but then you realize some people went to private school, some people went to Eton, you have rich black people, that's a thing, some people are royalty. So, you know, I think it's really important that as amazing as it is to use sociology to talk about all the things that black people have in common, it's also important to look at those differences and really dissect them to make sure that we are liberating all black people rather than just a particular group. That is amazing. Thank you so much, Maya. Um, and we'll be talking to Maya as well at the end. So if you have any questions for her, don't forget to pop those in the question and answer function below. Um, so now we're going to be chatting to Wayne. Um, hey, Wayne, where are you? <laughs> hey. Hey, I'm here. Hey, how are you? <laughs> I'm OK, thank you. Good, good. Um, so, Wayne, I have quite a few questions for you, actually. Um, and so firstly, can you just tell me about your background, um, about your parents, your grandparents, um, and what brought them and yourself to the UK? Where did they come from? That sort of thing. Yes, definitely. Um, sorry, excuse me, clearing my throat. Um, yeah, so, um, oh gosh, I mean, I, don't, I think I think I have to say before I go any further. Um, yeah, I'm really moved by listening to everybody so far. I think I think Maya, you alluded to the same sort of um, feeling. Um, yeah, and it's really impressing as well to listen to um, everybody else's sort of story of something quite similar. Yeah, it's it, everybody has experienced this in 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 very different ways. My story speaks to well a little bit of everybody so far. I have to say. Um, so. 
Um, my um, okay, so I've got this flag behind me. Obviously, um, there's there's Jamaican heritage in there, but I'm also half Antiguan. Um, my um, mother actually came over to the UK um, from uh, Kingston as a child, um, sort of just before she was becoming a teenager, really. So she was about 11, 12. Um, and she was sent over, or she was sent for basically by her parents. Um, she had been left in Jamaica um, as a child and an infant um, because it's my grandparents who came over. It's my great, it's my grandparents who were the sort of Windrush generation who, who, who came over to the UK. And my um, grandma and granddad, um, on both sides of the family, um, but particularly, I'm thinking of my of my mother's Jamaican heritage. My um, grandma and granddad, I think, came over and stayed with his brother um, somewhere in and around. Well, it would have been in London, in fact. And then from London, they moved out to Wolverhampton or to um, Staffordshire, that that sort of area. Um, similar story with my father, whose parents um, settled in in Leicester after a similar journey basically. So they arrived here and stayed with relatives. Um, and yeah, I think in terms of what it means to me, gosh, it's certainly um, what, oh, um, I think Sharon, yes. What Sharon was saying about community building and about, um, well, yeah, Sharon and um, I think, it's probably not just Sharon that's, that's mentioned that, but community building was really, really important for my um, for my grandparents. They, um, on my dad's side, were Adventists, so they were really religious. And, and there was this idea of Sabbath being a time when you invite the family round, um, but you also invite friends of the family round or anybody that you know who's in the community that needs a hand. Um, and they would celebrate Sabbath together on a Saturday, a Friday night, Saturday. Um, and yeah, it would mean a lot of cooking. And my father's from a large family as well of about five kids. Um, and they would cook from Friday and whoever came, they would be served food, good grief. And, and this was going on when I was a child and I was visiting um, and my, my grandfather had passed away before I was born, but the tradition remained. My grandma and my aunties would, would, would continue. And I didn't think that this really existed so much on my mother's side of the family, but then I discovered only at my grandfather's funeral, this is my mom's dad, who um, is there from Jamaica, um, at his funeral, the church, I was, I'm a musician. Um, I was playing the organ, so I didn't really see very much of the congregation because I was busily at the organ um, doing what organists do. Um, I went down during the communion because it was a Catholic church and the church was packed. Now, I thought that there'd be a lot of people because I could hear there were a lot of people because, you know, there was a lot of people singing the hymns. When black people are together in church, usually they sing hymns quite loudly. Um, and that's just the way how we do it. So I was shocked when I could see that there was no room for people to stand at the back and that there were people having to stand outside. And um, I felt really humbled because it was the same sort of level of community building. I did a bit more. I mean, I remembered that my granddad was always out in the community doing things for people, but it really it was really impressed upon me what he did. And it was it seemed to me that he was a person within his community that when boys particularly boys were having problems with the police or having problems in school having problems with their family whatever it was my grandfather that people in the community were going to in order to get help my grandfather had a bit of a legal head on him and would often be going and vouching for these people um these young men or or women as well and and their families and he became really quite well respected i mean this goes on both sides of the family they became pillars of the society not because i don't think because they were doing anything that they felt was special or important they were just being themselves and trying to help and that sense of community building and and the feeling you know sort of um i don't know a sense of the importance of bringing the people around you with you um, and being on a sort of journey with them that has Im impressed upon me i think being a grandkid sitting at the table being offered food from africa because somebody has come and brought some moi moi to the table and then passing around dumplings and and and, and plantain and and fried chicken in you know in the next hand and being told eat up wayne there's plenty of food 
um, you know, and having to make polite conversation with people that were from all over the place as well. Um, so, yeah, good tools for somebody that was going to be going to formal halls in Cambridge. You know, who who who, who knew that that was going to happen when I was about six? <clears throat> um, yeah. That's amazing. Um, and I can I can literally feel like as you were describing that, I could literally feel and imagine the hustle and bustle that is similar in my house around Christmas time, around people's birthdays, that sort of thing. It's such a lovely feeling. Um, so you um, you mentioned to me quite recently, actually, when we were chatting before, um, that you return to Jamaica quite regularly. Um, and so my question for you is, um, how has Windrush contributed to your identity as Black British? Um, but also, how has it contributed to your identity as Jamaican? if you feel as though you you have that mm, I would definitely say I um identify as black British um I don't think any <laughs> I don't think any Jamaican would um would have me um and I <laughs> and um I don't know really I I just don't really identify as as, as Jamaican I couldn't be it's a similar experience to, to to what to what Sharon describes um but um how, how how has what do what did you ask sorry anyway how has black, being black british um, i said uh, um how has windrush contributed to your identity as black british or and or identity as jamaican if you feel as though you have that yeah i think it's it contributes in such a way as to make me feel a great sense of pride um, about where my about where my family roots have have, have come from, basically of where where I come from, my roots. Although I don't in any way identify as you know being part of that generation, I I recognise in 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 the scandal really because when that first started to happen, I didn't know what it was. I was busy doing what I was doing. I think I was probably a secondary school teacher or trying to get this PhD started, um, and didn't know what it was and thought it didn't relate. Then lo and behold, I realized that actually the people affected were people quite close to, to, to my own family um, and had to find out about it and, you know, learned very much in a kind of late, slow kind of way um, on, on this particular um, issue. So I think really a sense of pride, but also a sense of loss. I think it's the same as some of the other speakers have alluded to, that sense of um, of, of erasure and um, of of displacement. But I want to say, when I think of, I mean, because this relates to my research as well. When when I think of you know black experience and also quote unquote the black body, which is another of these words. I don't like these terms, but they seem usable and useful at times. You know, I think there's a wonderful. There's an interesting way of, of thinking about this that's quite wonderful, um, where, you know, you think of the black experience or the black body, the black person. As this kind of this is going to sound really silly now, but as this kind of superhero, this superhero power, you've seen um, uh, what's X-Men. And you've seen Mystique. And you've seen how Mystique is able to kind of morph and kind of turn into, I don't know, jelly. And, 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 and then kind of morph into different areas. And this is how I think of the black kind of body, the black kind of experience. Yes, it's, it's kind of, it, it breaks down. It turns into liquid form. It can be malleable. It can, you know, it can be, um, it, it can be changed, but it all can also reform. And I think that's a wonderful kind of aspect of, of, of our identity and our heritage that I think we need to, well, I think that sometimes it can be expressed more and it can be expressed in a positive way as well um, and yeah I, I really think when I think back to my experience and where I am now and my parents and grandparents experiences I think good grief how many times have we been pushed down in one way or another or or, or kind of you know demolecularized <laughs> um, and then regrouped reformed turned into something else that's powerful you know um, I don't know, it's just an analogy that I was thinking of as I was thinking of the um, of this afternoon session. That's amazing. Thank you so much. And th honestly, there's so much I can relate to in that, like thinking about code switching and thinking about the way that you have to fit into certain environments and kind of 
relating back a little bit to what um, Maya was saying about being in Cambridge and then realizing, oh, I'm 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 different. I'm this other, and figuring out how to navigate that sort of environment. Um, so I can definitely relate to that. Um, my last question for you, Wayne. Um, so your research centers around eight, 18th century Jamaica um, and um, music in 18th century Jamaica um, specifically, um, and so in your idea or, or you know just your thoughts um many people would argue that music kind of in a similar way to how you describe food is quite important to black cultures and black british culture um and especially caribbean styles of music um so in what ways do you think the windrush generation has influenced more recent or popular styles of music in britain um, and does this link back to your research in any way Ooh, that's a very interesting question. Um, yeah, uh, ooh, I almost feel that I can't answer all of that, actually, because, well, I'll explain. Um, yeah, my research centres on 18th century music. And here I'm going to call Sharon's name yet again, Sharon, um, because I listened to what you were saying about our expectations of Black Britishness. Um, and I say our in, 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 in you know, in, in air quotes um just that sense of 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 you know you're, you're you're black so you should be interested in rap that kind of thing it, it really speaks to me very very loudly i am a classically trained musician i'm interested in all sorts of things that i suppose i shouldn't be interested in um like well i suppose like slavery like the 18th century um and so a lot of what i'm researching actually relates to classical forms of music production in 18th century Jamaica, and then trying to sort of resituate Black people in the musical expressions of Kingston in the 1770s. We've got all of this sort of um, theatrical music that was going on because it's been reported in the newspapers. Yet, of course, apparently, you know, the white population of Jamaica was outnumbered one to 10, or, you know, some huge ratio you know did di um, this um, disparity let's say that between the number of white people and the number of black people so you have all of this european um, musical expressions going on but then you know the archive tells us nothing about the majority population um and so i think this is there's, there's, a, there's a link here there are links here with the, the erasure of the past and then that continuing and perpetuating our lives today um in what our first speaker malik was saying um you know this idea of um the um the somerset case and of linking in with the american revolution and then this idea that there was a a, a legal system and then there had to be a moral justification for it this is all really feeding into my research um, and I'm having to question, you know, why as a historian, I suppose, as a music historian, I can't find the detail that I need. It's really difficult. Um, there is hardly any information about music in 18th century Jamaica. And that is because it's not the sorts of information that the elite white population of the time were recording. It wasn't seen as important like the full net or like giving a full name to a slave, for example and writing that name down. Um, or, you know, I've, I'm going through baptismal registers quite often and I will see just names, you know, a single um, first name and, and, and no other information. And you know that that person is a person of quote unquote color or a, a black person. Um, and yeah, it's, it is quite traumatic. Sorry, I'm kind of moving away from your question now, I recognize, but it is traumatic. The work that you do as a scholar if you're having to go through these records, I think the other day, just yesterday or the day before I was confronted by just horrific images. And, you know, to, to, to kind of respond to Sharon's point there about um, decolonization and of um, the idea that, um, you know, it's important, but is it, is, is it really, you know, is it really necessary in the way that it's being done? I would definitely echo that what Sharon said. I think it's right. Yes, it definitely needs to be done. Um, I think the question is how, really. And certainly my um, experience of, of studying his, I didn't do history at school. I mean, it seemed, it didn't seem particularly um, interesting to me, the, the opportunity of, 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 well, the sorts, the, the kind of history that I was being offered at GCSE and A-level wasn't the sorts of stuff that I wanted to discuss. Um, and 
now I'm horrified when I hear that the story isn't much different for people that are 19 and just coming into university like Maya. Um, you know, it doesn't seem to me like there's much difference in the, the, the curriculum that's being offered, really. And, and the, the discussion of the slave trade was horrific. And yes, there is this idea of black people, you know, the history of black people just beginning when... Um, when the when 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 the Windrush generation arrived, you know, I mean, there are lots of serious questions here to answer, <laughs> um, and I don't know. I think really my point is that in my research, I try to look at just this one little bit, this one little part of maybe forty years at the end of the eighteenth century. And as for the modern expressions, well, I think that that's um, perhaps for well people who follow modern um, music to decide. That was a very rambly answer. I'm really sorry. I've pulled out all sorts of things there. Um. No, that was amazing. Thank you so much. I know I gave you a lot to unpack there, <laughs> but that was fantastic. There was so much touched upon. Um, thank you so much, everyone. Um, we've now got about 15 or so minutes of q and I see some questions in um, the chat already, so I'm just going to dive into those. Um, and this first one actually is directed at Malik. Um, so this person has said, thank you, Malik, for your talk. Um, how do you express the complexity of your family history and how you identify yourself? In other words, how does being black, but also having a white mother condition your belonging? So um, actually, I'm looking at the question. There's a lot more to the question. Yeah, there's a lot to put yeah. yeah, well, the, the, I've, I've had a read through it, so um, okay. I'll try and unpack as much as I can. So I, I did a program recently on BBC Radio 4, it was a come out, I think just maybe two weeks ago. It's called Descendants. Um, so I would advise everyone to go and have a look at it. Um, and what they did was they looked at um, families who had connections through slavery um, and then they sort of joined them together. So in my episode, they, um, traced my ancestry, I traced my ancestry back to John Gladstone, the father of Prime Minister William Ewart Gladstone. And, um, you know, William Ewart Gladstone was supposed to have been an abolitionist. His father had massive slave holdings and plantations in Demerara. Um, and his father was an MP as well. But um, this other guy who they brought in um, had come from a family of abolitionists who'd argued with John Gladstone. So they created this we, 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 we sort of um, came together, if you like, in history. We, we are, our history is intersected. So this guy's a white guy who owns a printing mill that dates back to the 1830s that, you know, was founded on the proceeds of, of enslavement, but his family became abolitionists and, and, and argued, you know, with Gladstone. So this program, Descendants, is a series where they take all sorts of different characters trace their ancestry back and find a point from which they intersect with the next character. And then the series leads into each other in a seven part series. I've never seen anything done quite in that way. And it's really fascinating. Um, BBC Radio 4 Descendants, go and have a look. Mine is the second episode. But after having done that episode, um, I put it up on Twitter, you know, just done this episode of BBC, have a look at this. And somebody commented on the episode to say, oh, how terrible it is um, when a black man claims kinship with rapists and paedophiles, slave owners. So I'm saying, hang on a minute. First of all, my ancestors did not ask to be raped, to be enslaved, to be murdered, to be dismembered, you know, to be taken from their country and, and, and worked to death on a plantation in Demerara. I'm not claiming kinship with anyone. I am descended of who I'm descended of. I had no say in who I was the product of. So what I came to understand from my research is that many black people, um, particularly from the Caribbean, um, have white blood in them. And oftentimes that white blood was not willingly entered into. It was interjected through the hostility of the sexual exploitation of uh, enslaved women on the plantations. I had literally no choice. Um, I came across one story of um, a woman who, uh, an enslaved uh, African woman who had refused to um, come to her master's bed and she was pregnant. Um, so at that time, it was 
lawful up until a certain point, as Wayne will know, to um, lash a slave as long, as long as it was only up to 39 lashes. If it went beyond 39 lashes, it was considered illegal. Not that they cared about that because they were castrating them and breaking their bones and doing a whole range of other atrocities to them. But the official position was the lawful punishment that you could give to a slave was up to 39 lashes. So what they did with this woman, they took the cat and nine tails, which has got leather and knots in it. And then they literally lashed this woman round her back and onto her belly while she was heavily pregnant. Okay, So much so that with the 39 lashes, they broke the bones. Every single bone in the baby's body was broken, but the baby was born alive. And that case was brought in front of a tribunal and it was found that the, um, that the slave owner had the right to call a slave to his bed. And if she refused, um, she was in, you know, being insubordinate and therefore he had the right to give her 39 lashes. Now there was later on, there was a prohibition. I think it was after the 1823 uprising, there was a prohibition on, on, on lashing women because uh, they used to strip them naked and lash them uh, or they'd put them on the treadmill in Jamaica and they'd make them, you know, push the treadmill, which was like, you know, grinding sugar or whatever, and they would lash them as they were running on the treadmill naked. So all this depravity and stuff that they were doing at the time meant that people did not have the choice. If you happen to have a child of a slave master, the best that you could possibly hope for is that he might free the child. And in some cases, he might free you. And that was something that was probably more common among the Scottish slave owners in Demerara um, than it was in, for instance, the antebellum South in America, where, you know, not only would they not free you, they'd sell the child. Um, and this was probably more to do with the clan system in Scotland, as opposed to, you know, the kind of utilitarian um, uh, system they had in, in England at the time. So when you talk about um, your lineage and your mixed heritage, this is where it starts. So you have absolutely no say in that. You can't imagine the, the context within which um, these women existed. You know, I've seen accounts um, from a priest who went to Demerara and was talking about the prevalence of venereal disease among the black population in Demerara um, because as soon as a woman had been purchased uh, or a girl, no matter of what age, um, she was considered available for sex. Um, so, so you had guys from Scotland at a time after the Scottish Revolution, when there was poverty in Scotland, there was near starvation in Scotland, where the lowliest Scot could jump on a ship bound for the Caribbean, become an overseer on a plantation, and literally he's got 200 naked women walking around in front of him and he can do whatever he wants, and no one's going to say anything, and if anyone does, they're going to get the lash. So, so you can imagine the level of depravity that was happening on these plantations, or perhaps you can't, really it's hard to even conceive because the accounts, as Wayne was mentioning before, um, of the births and so on and so forth, it wasn't just, they weren't just like remiss in the way they recorded those accounts. Um, apart from the recordings of certain punishments, they were remiss in terms of what they were actually doing as well. They're not gonna say last night I raped my slave. You know, that, that, that didn't happen. What happened is these mixed race children started to occur. And then you started to have this, you know, whole population of, you know, whether it's in South African colonized, you know, Cape Coloreds or whether you've got the, um, you know, the, 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 the um, free women of color in Demerara, you know, the story of Dorothy Thomas and people like that who ended up, you know, uh, becoming rich in their own right and having agency. Um, some of these stories um, emerge and give us some insight into the nuances of that way of life. But mixed heritage starts there. You know, my family name, my father's family name, Watson, was inherited from Orkney and, and, and the, the Scots of Kerpore. So, we, you know, we, we don't ask to, you know, we don't claim kinship with these people. Um, we have that inherited um, trauma and we have that inherited bloodline uh, whether we like it or not I don't particularly like the fact that I am distantly related to John Gladstone but I am and if I go back through the history I find that connection 
and many people, you know, trace their name Hibberts back to, you know, one of the biggest slave trader, you know, the McLeans, you know, the McBeans, the the the, the Tinnies, you know, they just you name them, you you any of the names McDonald's, how many McDonald's do you know in Jamaica? Um, you know, these families they they didn't get the name. There's a there's a there's a misunderstanding that people just got the name because they were on the plantation of the guy who had the name. That is, uh, I found that to be really um, incorrect. Um, there's, there's an element of that, and you might find it from time to time. Um, but in general, when they got the name, it was because they were of the lineage. Um, and certainly that was the case in Demerara. They might deny the lineage, like Black Jack Gladstone, you know, um, who led the, um, uh, the uprising in 1823. Um, you know, he was he was denied by John Gladstone. John Gladstone never said he was his son, but he led the uprising that led to hundreds of whites getting killed. And John Gladstone was the chair of the, of the West India Committee at the time. There was the lobby group on behalf of the, the plantation owners. And, you know, when that rebellion was put down, he interjected and asked for clemency for Black Jack Gladstone and had him um, uh, exiled, uh, you know, I think to St. Kitts or St. Lucia or one of those places, rather than having him killed. Everyone else is getting their head chopped off and put on a spike. So, you know- sorry, Alec, Alec, sorry, just in the interest of time, do you mind wrapping up and then we'll, we'll ask another question really quickly. Well, that was, that was it really. What I'm saying is the, 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 the idea of being able to say, you know, you've got a, a black parent and a white parent and what does that mean in terms of, you know, your identity and so on. Um, it, it, the, it's far more convoluted than that. You know, it's not from this generation. It started way, way, way back there. Um, so in that sense, I don't sit here trying to necessarily um, unravel it to the extent of being definitive one way or the other. People look at me and say, you're black, I identify as black, but in truth, I have a Welsh mother, I have Scottish ancestry, my grandmother is, is indigenous Amerindian, and my grandfather is black African. Um, you know, so I have all of that in me. Um, so, you know, it's, that, that's who I am, that's what I am. You know, I identify as Malik. Thank you so much. That was a very coherent answer. Thank you. <laughs> um, so um, this is a question I'm just going to throw out to everyone. I think one of the, well, two of the recurring themes that have um, come up as we've been talking has been um, one around this idea of a universality of a uh, Black experience that Sharon um, first touched on. Um, but also this has kind of been contrasted with another idea of erasure and assimilation. And in some sense, um, the giving of a culture and the, um, and instilling a culture on a group of people. Um, and I think Maya touched on really briefly and so did Wayne, just how this has um, trickled through into today and um, how a lot of us and how a lot of you um, experience life today. So um, I was just wondering if each of you could touch really briefly on how that contrast or I guess that dialectic um, affects you in your life today um, and what we think can be done about that going forward um, before we wrap up. Yeah, okay. Um, I'm happy to go um, first on this one. Um, I think what can... I'm going to take the last part of your question first, because that seems to be, um, you know, a really easy thing to touch on. What, what do I think can be done to, to, to kind of, what do you, how can you say, ameliorate the situation, perhaps, if, if, that's, the, if that's the correct word? Um, it's education. I really do believe it's it's education. It's about having things like this. It's about listening. And I think the place, it's about listening and thinking and knowledge making, knowledge formation. And the place where all of this starts, it's got to start with education. It's got to start in school. And even before school, it's got to start with nursery, really. You know, um, now I'm gonna kind of go to the woof, to the flip side now and talk about university. But you know, I'm I'm in a faculty where a lot of people say, "Goodness me, why are there not more black people in 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 your discipline in your in in, in your faculty?" And and you know, I'm I'm faced with you know being encouraged to talk on panels that discuss the fact that there are very few black people in in in, in my in, in my um, area, which is musicology, um, in in the UK. And, um, you know, there's this idea of suddenly, oh, yes, we're going to just kind of magic these people. There must be. It's just that we haven't got the message out to them. They must be there. They're not there. And they're not there because people are not being trained in these sorts of fields and these sorts of areas at a young age. There is no interest or there is limited interest because 
as Sharon said, we've got very linear ideas sometimes of what it is to be Black British. And I love the fact that she said, you know, people that are Black British are typically, you know, um, if it, we've got no problem with seeing a rapper or with seeing somebody that's a, a female athlete, supreme athlete, um, um, I think it's the Williams sisters, although they're not British. Yeah, um, people like this. And then somebody that is, for example, a musicologist or an opera singer um, or an artist that's working on something that's not necessarily to do with Africa. Um, this is seen as sort of unusual or rare. You feel that you have to justify and, and kind of um, make your Britishness kind of, I don't know, kind of respond to some greater need to, to, to sort of assimilate. And I think, yes, the way that we can get out of these sorts of ruts um, of society is is through education, and I say that as a secondary school teacher. But um, you know, I, 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 yeah, I think I think a lot can be done there, and a lot can be done at school that that can't necessarily be done at home. And I'll end on this one point: when I when I when I left um, home, I left home when I first started going to school at age four or five. My mother sat me down; she didn't really sit me down, but I went. I must have told her something. And she said, remember, when you go to school, you are different. You are not the same. You must behave yourself. You must take it very seriously. It's very important. Education is your way you know, to success in the world. And I really got that message. I really got that. Something told me, you know, yeah, you're black. You're different. You can't necessarily expect to kind of go to school and just be like helped through. You have to try hard. And in some ways, I think that that's a great thing for a parent to tell their child but in other ways, I think, good grief, actually, that's not good. Because she was telling me from day one, you're something else. You don't really you don't really fit in. You can't be expected to be treated the same as everybody else. And so I've got mixed feelings about that kind of message. And what I'm saying is that schools are the places where those sorts of messages can get ironed out, I think. Um, I, I really do. And, 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 and people can kind of begin to come to terms with what the with, with the sorts of um social dynamics of the wider world it, it it begins in the home yes but a lot gets reinforced and pulled apart in school i'll stop there awesome thank you so much um just in the interest of time um maya um sharon and then malik do you mind summing that up a little bit quicker <laughs> no offense wayne <laughs> I think Wayne put it like really well. Um, so I guess just to like pick up on, on, on what's already been said, I think it is unfortunately still a big part of the black experience that you feel like there is only one way to be black and that there is even such thing as the black experience. Um, for me, I don't think my mum had that talk with me in primary school. Um, and so I sort of went through with maybe a bit of a naive thing. And again, South East London, I, I didn't feel like a minority. I didn't know what ethnic minority meant. There were like two white kids in each of my classes. It was, it never felt like an issue. Lots of my teachers looked like me, it was fine. And then when I went to secondary school, I think one of my first experiences of realizing, oh, people, oh, being interested in academia as a black person is unusual, uh, or at least people think it is, um, was I had a history teacher, I think year eight, funnily enough, she was teaching us about slavery, which is the irony, um, but she, I wrote a really long paper and I typed it off my little Lenovo laptop uh, and I was really excited about it and I handed it in. And the next week, the only comment that I got back on it was the word copied. Um, there was no like ticks, no markings, nothing. She just assumed that I'd copied the whole thing. Um, and when I asked her about it, you know, this never happened to me before. I'd always gotten really good feedback, more or less from teachers. She continued to try and test me on what certain words meant. And it was like, it was like embarrassing words that a five-year-old would know, but I was 14 at the time. So I just didn't understand why she found it so hard to accept that I was interested in this and I was good at this. Um, and so I think, you know, when you combat those experiences from, you know, outside of school, when you go to parties and Taylor Swift's on and a white person's like, oh, you're whiter than me. How do you know these lyrics kind of thing? But then a black person would also say the same thing. And so you have these really conflicting messages. Sorry, I really mean, sorry, someone's banging my door. Um, you have these really conflicting messages for, you know, a lot of your life and it's really hard to grapple with. Um, but I think, as Wayne said, I think education really is the key. I think showing that black people can do everything under the sun if we want to is really important um and yeah just instilling to those young black people out there there is no limit on what you can do 
if you want to do football and fall into those, you know, rapping, if you enjoy that, go for it, be amazing at it. You're, you don't have to be ashamed in doing those things. Um, but also that is so much more out there for you. And I hope that, you know, by the time I go on to have kids, <laughs> which is way into the future, um, things will be a lot different. Amazing, thank you. I think just to say very quickly that I sometimes feel very uncomfortable when we talk about black culture, because I don't know what that means. There are so many people on this earth who either identify as black or might be identified as black. How can we have one culture? What is that? Unless we're talking about a shared culture of resistance, that I understand, or a shared culture of protest, I get that, I understand that. But we cannot have just one culture because we come from so many different histories and we have traveled, you know, we've got so many different um, mig migration stories. And I think that actually what happens when we do that, I remember reading just recently, um, uh, uh, Franz Fanon, um, he was writing and he was saying that he had difficulties with um, African nations or African uh, communities identifying as one Africa because he argued that actually that, that that idea of yourself has been given to you by a, a colonial history. Whereas once upon a time, your identity was in much, much smaller units. You belong to a very small group of people, but now you've had to almost identify as a larger group of people in response to a particular history. And he was saying that we, know, we need to rethink that because we are repeating identities that have been given to us. And sometimes I think that we have to be careful that when we speak, that we ourselves don't essentialize ourselves, that I have to recognize that there is not a thing just called black people. We're just not the same. There's so many stories and histories and, you know, different ethnic express, all kinds of things. And I think that we have a job to do to let people know that we're not um, a kind of monotone thing, that, that we are that we're a variety and that there are lots and there's many and there's difference and I think that's okay and that hopefully that gives us the space to be many things not just one thing I think but yeah thank you thank you so much I think everyone summed that up so so well um so that brings us to the end of this amazing webinar I've really enjoyed sharing and I've loved hearing everybody's contributions um so many things have come out of this um oh, sorry the sun um whether it was um malik's amazing contributions about empire and slavery and that backdrop before we get to windrush and even the idea that windrush is not where black britain or black britishness began that there are stories before that is so important um also thinking about the intersection of race and class, which um, Maya talked to us about um, and how important that is, um, as well as Sharon's amazing contributions about the idea of a universality um, and how problematic that can be um, and the ways that we need to think about that and tailor that. And then Wayne's contributions as well about um, his experiences um, and music. This has all been so amazing to hear. Um, so thank you everyone for coming. Um, I just want to highlight one last thing. Um, this event actually was a precursor to a larger conference from the 6th to 7th of May 2022, um, which is titled The Post Windrush Generations, um, Black British Voices of Resistance. Um, and you can find out more about this on the Crash website. So I'm gonna link that um, in the chat below. Um, and we just want to highlight as well that this conference is part of a wider Black British Voices project, which seeks to create a nuanced and comprehensive account of the experience of being black in Britain um, by combining public national surveys with in-depth interviews and kind of get that idea that Sharon was talking about all these different experiences, all of these different voices and how together we can talk about black British voices and not a singular black British voice or singular black British experience. Um, so thank you everyone for coming. The links to those um, websites are in the chat um, and yeah, I hope you have a great rest of your day.